before we uh, begin here, I want to uh, draw you to your attention to uh, an announcement that's not in your bulletin, and that is that uh, after the service for middle school and high school girls, we got a study starting up on Saturday at Will and Bonnie Adams' home. Uh, Rachel and Megan will be leading it. It'll be through some of these devotionals and really digging into uh, Remade. You may have seen this as a new, uh, very popular uh, devotional by pa Paul Touches. It's all about identity in Christ. So please, after the service, uh, if that's a desire for middle school and high school girls to pick those up. As we make our way, though, I do want to direct your attention, if you'll open in your copy of God's Word, if you have it, or in your copy of the bulletin, to Luke chapter 2. We're going to be in Luke 2, verses 21 through 39 today. Again, that's Luke 2, 21 through 39. And as you get there, I want to um, voice, I think, a, a sentiment that many of us can relate to, and that's that the week after Christmas for the Christian world is quite possibly the strangest week of the year. Especially for those who don't necessarily have to go to work as usual, uh, one can get up after Christmas Day and, and feel as though, I don't really know what day it is, I'm not even sure if it's changed over to the next year yet. Everything is kind of in between and neither here nor there. And I think that's because of just how much busy waiting, how much fanfare there is building up to Christmas Day, that there's just sort of a, a haze that lingers over things really until the, the new year turns over and things get back to usual, kids go back to school and, and things of that nature. And I can imagine that after the nine months that they've had, that Mary and Joseph might be in a similar sort of place immediately after Christmas Day proper. It's been nine months of angel announcements, of going back and forth, of are we going through with this wedding, are we not, actually going through with it, which would have taken multiple days, actually being married, the, the new married life, a, a new life being grown within Mary's womb, then a census that turns everything on its head, the journey to Bethlehem, not having room in the inn, placing Jesus in the manger, shepherds, angels, the whole bit. And now what? The now what that we address here in verse 21 as we dive into the sort of aftermath of Christmas, if you will. So with that in mind, let's ask the Lord's help before we read and hear from his word. Our Heavenly Father, your word is perfect, it is pure, and it is true. But as we come to it, we find ourselves often mixed with doubt, distraction, and sin. So Lord, we, we ask your help. Would your spirit be powerfully moving among us to remove the blinders from our eyes, unstopping our ears, cause the, the clouds of doubt and distraction to flee from us? We might hear what you would have to say, that we might, as this year closes, be more and more shaped and drawn to you and to your son, for we pray it in his name. Amen. Hear now the word of the Lord, beginning at verse 21 of Luke chapter 2. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, Simeon took Jesus up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, behold, 
This child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel. And for a sign that is opposed, the sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. Here ends the scripture lesson. Truly, Lord, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Your light alone do we see light. Again, as we emerge with the Holy Family into the sort of post-Christmas haze, we get a few verses that are packed full of, of really the first five and a half weeks or so of Jesus' life that to the initial audience of the Gospels would have seemed for the most part, in the Hebrew world especially, very straightforward and very simple, maybe not so to us, because they undergo two quick things, two rites. The first is on the eighth day, when Jesus had been uh, alive for eight days, they took him and named him Jesus, uh, as had been announced by the angel, and they circumcised him, giving him the mark that had been given for roughly 2,000 or so years for the people of Israel, separating them off, as well as testifying to the promise that God had made with Abraham, their forefather, that one of their seed, one of the offspring of Abraham, would be the blessing of all the world. So the circumcision happened, and then 33 days later, we pick up in verse 22, with a purification rite that would have happened uh, in, in giving either a lamb, or in this case, it seems they're uh, not as financially well off, I can imagine, they are a young married couple, they give the turtle doves, or two young pigeons, as a purification offering. And while we don't have time to get into all of the ins and outs of why these things were happening and the symbolism happening there, I want us to notice, in passing, at the very least, that Mary and Joseph would not have had what to expect while you're expecting uh, or, or baby wise or some of the other early parenting, early childhood sort of literature that we maybe have today, but they knew the one book that really did matter. They knew the scriptures. And very simply, very faithfully, very conventionally, they were seeking not only to live that out for themselves, but to live that out in light of the family context. No matter how remarkable Jesus was, they were raising him up as one of the people. And as, again, we pass through here, notice a passing resemblance to what we do and what we believe happens in infant baptism. That in both the circumcision and the purification offering that were happening here, Mary and Joseph, as well as many other Hebrew couples, are testifying to the fact that that child is a gift from God. It does not belong to them, ultimately. That this is God's gift, and as such, because of their calling in faith, they must raise this child up in the faith. And so they give them the identity marker of the people and say, this is who you are. Now live like that. Now again, that's really after verse 24 where the conventional everyday sort of stuff ends. Because in verse 25, we get really what makes this passage uh, interesting. And that's sort of an odd couple, if we could call them that. One of them gets the most screen time, and that's the first one that we are introduced to. And we're told that his name is Simeon, and he lives in Jerusalem. We're not told uh, anything about his family, anything about his background, his trade, uh, his tribe, anything like that. He seems to be an older gentleman. Given what we know later, he is close to death. And outside of that, we know that he's righteous and devout. That he has been waiting for the consolation of Israel. So for most people in Jerusalem, he would likely be just your normal, everyday, elderly fellow. Except once you got to talking to Simeon, past the usual pleasantries and small talk, you start to realize that he's got this one little quirk about him. And that's that he believes, beyond the shadow of a doubt, that God has spoken to him individually and has told him that before he dies, he will see the Lord's Christ. He will see the Messiah, the anointed king of God. And I imagine that Simeon's been waiting now for probably many years. We're not told exactly how long. 
And maybe earlier on in life, once people heard him say that, they might have said, sure, Simeon, that's, that's cute, but maybe, maybe so. And then as the years went on and Simeon got older and older and got closer and closer to the end of his natural life, the eye rolling and the blessing of his heart would have increased even more so. Simeon was probably a little bit of a strange fellow in some ways, but had a good heart. But little did he know, probably, that morning when he woke up, that this was the day. And so, prompted by the Holy Spirit, he's drawn, I mean, I imagine he made his way through the temple many times. He's drawn back to the temple to do his usual rounds. But as he's there, he notices a couple, ordinary couple, pretty conventional, little baby boy, about five and a half weeks old, feels drawn. And so like a, a, a magnet that draws metal filings, he shuffles his way over to this couple, taps Mary's young shoulder, and says, ma'am, may I hold him? Probably looking at Joseph and then looking back at Simeon, maybe even reluctantly, Mary obliges, hands Simeon the child, and he realizes in that moment that all he's been waiting for, all he's been looking forward to, is right in his arms. I don't know what Simeon imagined when the Lord told him that he would see the Christ, that he would see the Messiah. Maybe he did imagine, like many, that it would be a very obvious, very prominent, very obvious display of this is an older adult man who is strong, stately appearance, who is ready to take up arms against the Romans. This is going to be the Messiah, and that's how I'll know when I see him. Whatever he expected, with the eyes of faith, he knew this was it. This was the one born a child and yet so he starts to sing. It's, it's almost like a musical. Um, Simeon probably, I imagine, shakily at first and, 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 and quietly. His voice grows as time goes on. He sings, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. I can finally die happy because I've seen what you've prepared. According to your word, your salvation, the presence of all peoples. He will be a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Having sung his song, he hands the child back to Mary. The, the couple are still a bit befuddled and think it's a bit strange what's happened to them, and he blesses them. Perhaps it's a blessing for a consistent sleep schedule at this point. And then he speaks individually to Mary. Probably individually to Mary, because we can piece together from the gospel accounts that likely Joseph passes before Jesus comes of age. So specifically, Mary needs this. He tells Mary what kind of man this child will be. That he will be great for some, and he will be a terror in many ways for others. And that individually, uniquely for Mary, her own soul will be pierced on his account. I think all parents, especially mothers, can understand something of what Mary is being told there, the piercing on account of her child, to, to rear and grow up and send off a child is to be pierced. It's not going to be easy, but especially for Mary, who saw then her son betrayed, abandoned, beaten, crucified, buried, Mary would go through it. She would be pierced time and time again before the end, and she would reflect on these words and remember them. Simeon backs away, having said his cryptic words, and then we're introduced to the other of the, the characters in this odd couple, and that's Anna. We're not told anything that Anna says. We're not told much about her, but the one thing we really do know about her, outside of her being a prophetess, and we don't get any of her prophecies, is that she's very, very old. She's either 84 years old and has been in the temple ever since she was young and her husband died. She doesn't seem to have any children. They would likely be caring for her in that case. Or she has been in the temple 84 years since her husband died. It's a little bit difficult there with the translation. Point is, she's incredibly old and has been in the temple for decades and decades. And while she's been there, she has been, like Simeon, waiting for something. She's been waiting for the redemption of Israel, the one who would redeem them and set them free. I imagine it seems as though Mary, or Anna doesn't even really 
necessarily talk to the Holy Family. She sees them from afar, knows Simeon. They walk in the same circles a lot of times. She knows exactly what's happening, and she cannot withhold herself. So she goes out and tells all of her friends that she knows are waiting for the same thing, waiting for the redemption of Israel. It's the end of our of our passage, Mary and Joseph go back to Galilee, and in between there and the next story is the flight to Egypt and all that happens there. Quite an interesting story. Maybe it seems at first that there's not much here that can speak to us individually, but there's, there's so much here, and I hope you see that. I want to note three points of direct application, I think, for us as we wrap this into ourselves. The first, very briefly, is the fact that I hope you notice the irony of the kind of people that... God is bringing into the story in these first few chapters, and then it'll continue on through. This is just a theme that happens throughout. Mary and Joseph are not the couple that certainly we would write in as the parents of the Christ child. They're, yes, from David's line, but that was about a thousand years ago. It'd be like if you could say that I'm from Charlemagne, and that's great and all, but it really doesn't do you anything in the modern day. So their their line is pretty... uh, non-noteworthy at this point. They're not even rich enough, again, to afford the lamb, so they're not the people we would write into the story. Nor are the first witnesses, the shepherds, who, who testify to Christ's birth. And then we have Simeon and Anna. And I think the more and more I read it, the more and more I'm struck by the fact that I don't think Simeon and Anna, like many of the people that are drawn into Jesus' magnetic field, they're not the kind of people we'd usually want to go on vacation with. Or have long, long, drawn-out conversations. Maybe, again, small talk, but not much more than that. Suffice it to say for our purposes today that the, the kingdom of Christ is blessedly made up of a lot more than just the best and brightest in Baton Rouge. Um, Rachel and I noticed something almost instantly when we moved here about two and a half years ago. Something that we admire and love, but are also aware of, and I think you probably are as well. And that's just how beautiful things are here. It's not just this church, and it's not just the scenery, it's people. Y'all are well put together, and I say that in in the best way I can. Everything seems well put in place. You know how to talk and engage with others. It's very different from some places we were raised in, not to say anything about them either. But it's something we have to be aware of, that we are in many ways in in a bubble, And if we become so concerned with having everything just right and just put in place, and we get uncomfortable with the sorts like Simeon and Anna, who are probably a little frazzled, a little different, not exactly the sort that usually you'd be rubbing elbows with, if we're afraid of them, then our priorities are getting out of whack. We need to remember the sorts of people that are being drawn into this kingdom. Rachel and I were just reading this morning from from Luke 8 how we have a a woman who's supporting Jesus' ministry, who's from Herod's household. We have the high and the low in this family. So we need to embrace that with both arms. Second thing is to notice the character of the faithfulness that's being portrayed by each of the four adult figures presented to us, for Mary and for Joseph, as well as for Simeon and for Anna. It is a simple, everyday straightforward sort of devotion and piety. Nothing flashy here. Okay, yes, Anna was pretty much living in the temple. I don't expect you to be living in the church. I don't think we can legally do that. But Mary and Joseph had God's word. It was the Old Testament at that point. They were seeking to live it out simply. Simeon knew his Old Testament. The Old Testament's everywhere in this passage. And he was trusting in God's promise and waiting. And so was Anna. They were, she was praying and fasting. I'm trying to combine those. Praying and fasting. Very simple things that these folks are doing. And I think this hit me because as we look ahead at a new year, and we rightly should be thinking about um, habits to remove from our lives and new habits to put on, I want us to be careful about being drawn into the siren song of our age, which is to have everything instantly, to expect instantaneous results, to want everything, including our spiritual lives, to be microwaved. That's not how it works. That's why if we can, we can really press into, I think that's actually what I titled, this was like two weeks ago, so it's not really reflective of what I've been saying, but waiting is maybe the theme word of what's happening. Waiting and finally seeing it, but waiting It's a consistent refrain in the Old Testament. I think it's the second most repeated imperative outside of do not fear. It's to wait. 
It's because the things that really yield results in the Christian life are going to take time. They're not going to be quick. And when we expect ourselves and the things around us to be put together quickly, we're going to put together a Bible reading plan, we're going to start a, a, a prayer practice, and we expect that in a month everything's going to change, that's lying to ourselves. And not only is it, is it lying to ourselves, but we're going to crumble under the weight because we place that on our own shoulders to feel like I need to see everything happen instantly. And so when you're thinking about forecasting for 2024 and Lord willing for many years to come, I, I really want you to try and take a more long-term view and understand that it's often the simple things done steadily, ploddingly over a long period of time that yield the most results. But we can't do them anymore, at least we, we think we can't do them, because we're so obsessed with having things quickly. I want us to be able to, to start to change our minds and recalibrate in that way. There are some things that we have jettisoned uh, in, in our everyday devotional lives that have really hurt us, that, that are historically part of the Reformed Presbyterian faith. And we've jettisoned them because they're hard and they take a lot of time. Catechesis is something that's borderline unheard of. If you've not read through the Westminster Shorter Catechism, I would, I would advise it. It's, it was made actually for children. It's hard for adults to memorize now. But the reason we don't do it is because it seems dry and dusty and it takes a long time. Yes, everything does that's worth it. And same with, with family worship and family devotional. Y'all, if... If your resolution, those of you who have teenage kids, was to have your teens at every youth function twice a week devo or, uh, devotedly there, I would love that. But I would rather you start a consistent day-to-day -day family devotional practice. Hearing God's word, especially from the Father if that's possible. Hearing God's word, praying God's word, singing God's word if possible. That can be awkward at the start. But these are hard things that are very, very simple, not flashy. But if you lean into them, not just for a month or two, but for years, they'll start to yield great fruit. It's all about waiting on the Lord. It's often said that you can tell what somebody really loves by what they spend their money on, and I think it's actually even more true to say that you can tell what somebody loves by what they're willing to wait for, by what they're willing to spend their time on. So what are you willing to spend your time on in 2024? Not just little bits here and there, not just the first month and try it out, but to really devote yourself some, to something that hopefully is not just for a year, but two, four, five, ten, even longer, however much time the Lord will give you. Think long term, but think simple. Take one step by one step as the Lord leads you in that same direction. And maybe before I move on to the last point, um, maybe you'd come to me and say that, that I've been doing that. I'm trying, and it seems like it's been a very long time, but I feel like I'm spinning my wheels and I'm going nowhere. And yeah, that can often feel like the case. But know that when God leads us oftentimes through that long valley of humiliation, he is there with us, even if we don't feel it. God is directing the ship. You are left to row. So let's row faithfully waiting on the Lord this coming year. Now the final thing I want us to begin to think about as we start to close is the sort of elephant in the room. I've, I've barely even touched on the child himself. There's so much, and we could spend weeks discussing how this passage really forecasts beautifully who this child will be and what he will do, the, the character, the person, the work of Christ. We're told that he is the consolation of Israel. The word means comfort, and it's pulling from Isaiah 40, where comfort, comfort my people. It's the hinge point of Isaiah, where it goes from a real note of judgment to a note of salvation and mercy. And if we read that passage in Isaiah 40, we realize that the comfort comes from the iniquities of God's people being pardoned. That's why then, when Simeon picks up the Christ child, he says, Lord, I have seen your salvation. That Christ himself is the salvation of God. That's what his name means. Salvation belongs to the Lord. 
And then we're told later that he is to be the redemption of Israel. To redeem, of course, you know, is to, to buy back from slavery. So like a, a second and greater Moses figure, he would lead his people out of slavery to sin, self, and death. And how would he do that? Well, you notice maybe that the law is really prominent in this passage. It's repeated five times. It's because he came to fulfill the law. He came to put himself in the place that we are, yet having all of us gone astray and not fulfilled the law, he came to perfectly fulfill it, to give us a righteousness not our own, to give it to us as a gift of his grace by faith. He came as the great law fulfiller. And in, and in doing so, he brought Jew and Gentile together. He's a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to the people Israel. He brings those who were distant close in one bond of faith. While we could get to each and every one of those and spend weeks on them, the one thing I want to close on and think about is in verses 34 and 35. As Simeon speaks of this child, he says this to Mary, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Simeon is saying here something I think we all understand, that there is no figure more divisive in all of history than Jesus Christ. There is no person who can be both simultaneously the most beloved of all time and the most hated and despised. This is something, again, that's all throughout. And, and Peter pulls on this. I believe it's in 1 Peter 2. And he pulls from Isaiah 8, 20, 8, 28, as well as Psalm 118, and talks about the cornerstone, who is both the rock of refuge and the stone of stumbling. What Simeon is getting at, what Peter gets at, what the Bible is trying to tell us here, and what I want us to definitely walk away from here knowing is that there is no in-between with him can't straddle a line with Jesus. He is either to you savior, rock of refuge under which you will find shelter in the day of trouble, or he is a stone of stumbling upon which you'll be crushed. The difference is found in whether or not you really feel the need for the things we just talked about. Do you need the comfort, not just the temporary comfort, but a comfort of sins forgiven? Do you need a salvation that comes from God that you can't work up of yourself? Do you feel the chains of your own slavery that you need to be redeemed from? Do you need one to fulfill the law in your place and to unite those who were once far? If so, coming humbly to him is a rock of refuge for you. But know also to those of you who have hidden under the refuge that he is, that he is a sign that is opposed. And if he was a sign that was opposed in his own day, he's a sign that is still opposed today. And as we walk into 2024, know that that will cost something that will be difficult. That the road of the cross is the road of death. At the very least, it's going to be difficult in dying to your own sins, but it also likely will cost you, whether relationally, financially, business-wise, whatever it may be. But know that as God puts us into those waters, it's for a purpose. So like Mary, as she looked into her own difficulty, and like Flint set her face, knowing that God would be faithful through it, know that it's worth it. Let's be ready in 2024 for whatever may come, taking one step at a time, being willing to wait on the Lord and to give thanks that we have such a Redeemer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that though we have been far off, you have drawn near. You have come to us in this one that, who was once a child and yet a king, who is our redeemer, our comforter, our salvation. So teach us to walk in his footsteps, to follow faithfully after him, to be those who are patient, who are willing to wait who are willing to look ahead to what is to come and know that no matter what may come in the days before us, in the endless ages that will be ours, it will all be worth it. So strengthen us, we ask in Christ.